Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I've implemented a number of compliance control frameworks for Adobe's Document Cloud. It's one of the three Adobe Clouds, and it's one that includes digital signatures, as well as the whole Acrobat ecosystem. So we're talking about a very large uh, ecosystem uh, and very, very stringent needs for security. And we've been working on PCI and HIPAA and SOC and all of these, um, all of these various compliance frameworks. I want to get an idea of where you're all at, though. Uh, how many people here are operating under one of these frameworks today? Well, much of the room. How many are going to be or are implementing now? You got a few there? Okay, well, this will be a nice trip down memory lane for some of you, um, and hopefully with a few bits of inspiration uh, in it. The compliance controls themselves, as you're probably aware, there's a ton of information in there, and it, you can't really assimilate it all. Um, but it's important because it actually defines a, a perimeter for you that can stop you from having to stay up at night thinking about all the things that you normally think of because these controls can really increase, uh, they're there to increase your security. Um, but it's still pr pretty overwhelming work. So what I'm trying to do here is to go from sort of 10,000 feet down into a specific control and the specific example I'm going to use is change management and I'm going to lay that example on top of a continuous pipeline. So a, sort of a the thing that you might take out of here that's concrete is how to put change management in an automated continuous deployment environment. So before I start though, let's talk about all these frameworks. There's a lot of different frameworks uh, and those of you who have done one and been through an audit know that there's a lot of very precise language that goes along with this. I had uh, an experience once where I spent literally 10 minutes in confusion with a compliance officer because I was conflating you know, a standard with a policy, and I was just kind of using them as the same term, that that's not okay for an auditor. They have very specific um, ways to talk about things. And in fact, often the first question in, in an audit is, show me your architecture diagram. And so you pull it out, you I was ready for that, right? And you got the diagram right here, and they say, okay, where's the, where's the CHD? And you say, well, there's the data store. It's in the data store. And then they say, can you label it on the chart so that we know? And this gives you an insight into how to be good at audits, you, knowing what auditors want makes the whole thing a lot smoother. Um, but there are a lot of controls, and so let's figure out, let's talk about what, what they mean. And, and if you have to do a lot of them, you'll find that there's a lot of common elements between them. So Adobe did something really, um, really helpful a number of years back, and that is that we took all the frameworks that we wanted to comply with, we extracted all the controls, and then we resorted them deduplicated them, and then created one control that would address the controls in each body of, uh, of the frameworks. And we call this the Common Controls Framework, the CCF, and it's a method of well, unified compliance mapping. Um, and this is amazing, because now I can build one change control system, and I know that it'll pass SOC and PCI and all of the others, because I'm building for all of them at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so this is the scope of the work. I want to talk about the impact of the work now and the cyclical nature of it. Because one of the hard truths of compliance work is that when you're done, you're, you're just starting. Right? When you look at one of these frameworks, sometimes you have to do real work. You know, you'll have to do encryption at rest, or you might have to do encryption between two points inside your network that you never covered before. Um, <clears throat> um, but after that's all done, you have to run the controls and not only that, they have to be effective, and you are going to be audited against that effectiveness. Um, and so I created what I call the chainsaw chart. And this sort of tries to outline the cyclical nature when you're done implementing the controls. And I, I think most of the blades are pretty obvious, so I'm going to focus on the continuous circle there. But clearly there are things that happen on timers here, right? So every once in a while you have to do an access review and you have to review all the people who have access to all the systems, potentially even making sure that somebody else has authorized that they should have that access. There's all kinds of things that happen on timers. Um, but the interesting thing, and the reason I call it continuous compliance, is that um, there's a couple of continuous processes that are really important, actually more than a couple. And they take two forms. One is something that's actively running all the time, like intrusion detection or file integrity monitoring. Right? Always got that looking for a problem. And then there's some that only execute when there's a request. And access control is a great example of this. 
there's a whole protocol or process or whatever for how you do access control. And it sits there idle until somebody makes a request and then it happens. And that's actually a really important point because it has to happen that way every time and it has to be available at all times because if somebody leaves, you need to kill them right away, right? Not kill them personally, kill their account. I'm gonna try to stay away from the hate today. Um, and so um, the interesting thing about the blades then is that they actually define what your workload is gonna look like over time. So you can actually plot that out and I'm gonna give you a completely hypothetical kind of plot. <laughs> Um, where we take a scrum team and we look at the work related to two different tracks. The green chartreuse, whatever you want to call it, line, is just like a normal scrum project. They had a really big obligation in the summer and so they did a lot of extra work. But the blue line is the compliance work that's going on at the same time and it's pretty clear from either view that you need to account for that. Otherwise, you wind up in a very, very bad situation. You wind up in the, the movable object meets the unstoppable force. The immovable object is your compliance problem, right? Your deadline or whatever it is that's due. The unstoppable force is usually a feature. And that's not a good position to be in. And usually I think compliance will trump the feature. Um, so you don't really want to get into that state if you can avoid it. But compliance work I've found is really all about how you look at it. Having a model to figure out how to approach and see if things are effective is important. So when I think about controls, and I'm gonna use change a lot as, a, as an example control, um, there's four contexts that I like to think about. Um, the process context is that you, you have a process, change control, access control, you have to have a process for that. And the process may have certain features, like in, in change control, for example, the process needs to enforce segregation of duties. So you don't want one person doing every single thing to take a change all the way out to production. It's also called the 4i principle. It's usually done through peer review and through some kind of approval mechanism, but this is the process context of a control. The code context, which I'll speak probably the least about, um, speaks to the fact that your code has to be secure. Most companies have an SDLC or some kind of software lifecycle process. That's actually mandated by a number of the frameworks and you need to build stuff in compliance with that and very often you need to do code scans and other activities to make sure you're not introducing any vulnerabilities uh, with code that you create. The two on the bottom are the ones that I like the most. Um, probably because I run a lot of controls and so I'm dealing with evidence all the time, my view of the compliance framework is from really the ground up. So the evidence context says that there's a whole bunch of controls, they require evidence to make sure that they're effective are you delivering the evidence or not? And I'm gonna introduce later a concept which I hesitate to even say, evidence-driven design, because there has to be a star-driven design at every DevOps conference, <clears throat> that's new. Um, but it's just a way of thinking about it. Um, and it's, it's a way of saying, maybe when I'm doing this, I should look at what the evidence requirements are for the controls related to whatever I'm working on and making sure that I'm generating that evidence and storing it somewhere that's safe. And then the infrastructure context is really, um, actually it sounds like network and stuff like that, but I'm really talking more about um, uh, the tools and other things that you have. So you have a tool chain that has a lot of stuff in it. That stuff can impact your data and your code. And so it could end up being in scope for compliance depending on what you do. So let's talk, let's dive further down and start talking about a particular control. In this case, I'm gonna talk about change management and continuous delivery. So I need a pipeline. Here's my made up continuous delivery pipeline. I actually used to show the Docker slide, but I won't spend the time on that now. Most of the, if you look for continuous pipelines, you'll find diagrams that look fairly similar to this. There's some beginning stage where you're doing development and iteration that leads to a request to promote and then you cycle through some environments out to prod. And how quickly and automatically you do that is you know, dependent on, on your own shop. And then there's this sort of gray line at the bottom which says there's some kind of command and control infrastructure there. It might be stuff that you do with Jenkins. There's a number of fine vendors here who will sell you a solution. Um, but that command and control plane is really important because it's probably got evidence that you need um, for a compliance audit. Uh, so where does that evidence come from? 
let's, uh, so let's get really specific and talk about change control. And let's say this is the evidence you need. And it's not a bad proxy for what they would ask for in a, in a change management um, review. Um, why are you doing it? What code did you change? Uh, risk and impact, you can see, you can read the rest of it. And then, you know, some audit trail of how it moved through um, to production. So the question is, how does this map to that pipeline and where does the evidence come from for change control? And if you haven't been through an audit, what often happens is the auditor will come in and say, just pick five changes that you did in production or tell me the last five. And then I want to see a description of what changed, all the code that changed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line. And then a few days later, you give them a nice package that has all of this stuff, um, if you have it. So let's go through the experience of mapping some of this stuff out as an example to, to get you going. So there's some easy, easy wins here. Um, a lot of people are using Git and Jenkins. Um, and so code changes, really simple. You have a source control of some kind. It's going to tell you what your code is. You just have to know right, what reference to get the information from. Uh, most shops also have Jenkins or Sost or some kind of test infrastructure. This is where your test results come from. Um, so that's really clean and easy. But what about all this other data? Well, that command and control plane that I mentioned, that's got a lot of interesting stuff. That may have issued a unique identifier for the change, although actually a lot of times it's just a pull request number. Um, and um, uh, I don't know what screen to look at. Did I advance? No, I didn't advance. That's why. Um, this stuff is harder. Um, and it's important. So, like, need, risk, and impact feel like um, things I don't want to worry about, frankly, when I'm pushing a change out. But they're super important to the change control process. That compliance officers really like for you to have classified and defined something and then live by that. So when it comes to the need, and I say new features for customers, that's a pretty good explanation for an auditor, even though it doesn't tell you anything about what the feature was. You could have three categories there that were really brutally simple. Product feature, infrastructure feature, um, break fix change. Um, that makes an auditor really happy because then you're just saying it's one of those three and they, and they instantly know that there's, a, that there's some um, uh, standard behind it. Now I want to talk about agility and speed and change is sort of historically been the, ana you know, the anathema of speed. And when I first started doing change control, it evoked the, um, um, you know, this idea of a change board that meets and there's a spreadsheet and you've got all this stuff written down. And the reality is that that is a very flawed approach these days um, for a lot of reasons. Um, so if we want to automate things, then um, we have to figure out how we're going to meet the same kind of effectiveness that a human would have if they were making that decision just before we launched a prod. So we'll talk about that in one second, but there's a hidden, there's a hidden implication of what I just put up here that's really important. And that is, let's say you do get your test results, you run Jenkins and Jenkins runs a bunch, it has a bunch of um, result sets there for all the stuff that you put through. That is now a system of record in your compliance portfolio. So if you like fill up a drive on that machine, can't just go and blow away the last 15 builds because you might need that data a year from now from an audit. So you need to be really careful about when you're actually pulling your pipeline systems into the context of being compliance systems because they will have potentially different requirements for retention and security. Uh, so this is what I was talking about, about classification. Now these are, here's a set of approval criteria that one might use to decide whether or not to go to production. Um, and uh, you can see peer review, so that's your segregate, you know, that's four eyes. Um, the low risk, no or low impact. And let me drill on that for a second. Um, because a lot of this is about risk, if you want to automate something, you really have to have it set up so that it doesn't pre present a risk. Otherwise, it's not an effective process, right? If you release something through this pipeline and it causes a customer impact, then something was wrong. Right? And particularly, the low risk and low impact stuff was wrong. 
So in our implementations, at least the ones I'm working on, we only allow automation if those, those two things are in place. Those two um, key criteria are low and low, zero and zero. Um, <clears throat> and again, that's um, the kind of um, definition that tends to make auditors um, pretty happy. So, um, so what's the human involvement in this? Well, let's look at it from a process flow point of view. This is a, this is a process diagram that models uh, an automated change control system uh, that we use internally. Um, so that gray sort of line, that back plane, that's stuff that we wrote. Um, and I'm actually going to just get off the stage and point around here. So all this stuff on the left, this is what I was talking about. This is a build, this is a development cycle, right? This is getting ready to promote, um, doing development, testing, getting peer review, potentially getting security review, whatnot. Then we have the promote phase. That's the last point that a human needs to touch things. So at that point, a person will make a judgment saying, yes, this is a package that should be promoted to production because of the criteria that I, I just listed. Now, a lot of that can be automated. Right? So that list of things, if you can automate all of those questions, you can actually even automate this step. I could say, as the change control owner, I approve any change that meets all those requirements. Um, so that you don't have to have a stop in the process. We like to have at least one stop in the process because after promote, now you're really in motion, right? So then you're gonna start looping through environments. So the way this works is that it's probably not one. So in a simple case, it's maybe integration, stage, and prod. Um, in our case, it may also be integration, stage, prod US, prod EU, prod Australia, prod Japan however that goes. But the point is that these are going to run, they're going to execute, and if there's any trouble making that uh, deployment happen, they immediately roll back so you're not left in a state where you've got the wrong thing going. And then as you can see, uh, the final yes, if it's prod, or the last of the prods, uh, we have merged to master in here. That's just an artifact of the way that we do um, our continuous um, deployment. <clears throat> All right. So let's... Um, Let's take a little bit more provocative example of a, of a tool chain, because I want to get into some of the other contexts. Because change control, access control are sort of the obvious ones. Access control in particular is the one that keeps me up at night. And the reason is because once I implemented it, I realized how leaky a system I had, even with the control in place. And you have to ask yourself the question, like when somebody leaves your organization, do you really take them out of every system they were in? And how do you know that? And I'll tell you that I went back and my first audit, I found contractors who were working in different countries who I didn't even know who they were, right? So this can be a very leaky system. Why is this important? Well, because look at the tools that you tend to use in your pipeline. Right? There's all these tools. Now, these tools can affect your compliance um, requirements. For example, if they don't have single sign-on. Single sign-on is like the best thing you can do for access control because you kill, you kill it in one place and everything turns off. But we can't find a complete set of tools. It's hard to find a complete set of tools that use SSO. So you're gonna end up issuing local accounts and that means you have to revoke them and change elevated privileges and all of that. Um, the other thing is that you might be incorporating code from a third party, in which case you're triggering a whole bunch of other stuff, right? You have to scan, the code has to be secure, it can't access the data in a wrong way, et cetera. And then also this issue of data governance. Uh, let's take a particular example, log file processing. So I know Splunk is in the vendor room. Um, we use Splunk, we use Sumo too. They're fantastic tools. But if you're sending them data, you have to examine what data you're sending them and whether or not it's in scope for one of these compliance requirements. And it gets pretty hairy at that point because the interpretation of what is EPHI for example, can be very broad. We have one case where our lawyers are arguing that an IP address can be um, EPHI in certain contexts. It's very hard to run a big internet service without knowing IP addresses. The simpler cases are like file names, um, user accounts. These all have to be masked in some way if you don't want to trigger that particular infrastructure to be in scope. And that's important because some of these companies will say no, right? Even to Adobe, 
we've had companies say, no, we're not going to do that. And so we've had to switch out. Um, and this sort of, there's a bunch of hard truths in compliance work, but um, one of the most important ones is this, this isn't optional. Like, this has to happen. You will be audited. And part of the audit process is to determine if the control is effective. If it's not, then you have to make changes to it to make it effective. So it never really goes away. Now, um, <clears throat> I told you that I, I wanted to promote this idea of evidence-driven design. All I'm really saying is that when you're working on code, you should be aware of what controls might affect that code and check to see if you're generating the evidence that's required um, to meet the, that standard. It's hugely important because if you don't do that, then you have debt, right? You're just creating debt, and then later on, you're going to have to come back and, and address it. And worse off, you're going to have some very awkward conversations with the auditors when they say, where is the X? And you say, I don't track that. Um, and I do um, want to end on, I guess, more of an inspirational note, because honestly, this is a really dry topic, you know? And like, you get into all these controls, and it's like watching paint dry sometimes. But let me ask you this. We're talking about um, PCI and HIPAA, and so I'd say, whose data are we protecting? Yours. So I have a very personal relationship to PCI and HIPAA, because I expect that when I'm interacting with companies, and they have those compliance frameworks in place that my data is safe. So it's my responsibility to make sure that your data is safe, and I consider that to be my data as well. I use my own services, so my credit cards are in Adobe. Um, so it, for me, it's very personal, and, um, and uh, I think super important to not say, I don't want to do this because it's big and scary and it's not going to add any value, but to flip that equation around and say, I'm kept up at night by all these things that I'm worried about that are going to happen. But if I implement those 100 control, controls you saw, it actually covers all those things I worry about at night. And then I can worry about the really esoteric problems. Um, so I'm going to end there two minutes and 24 seconds early, in case there are any, in case there are any questions. And I thank you all for your attention. There's a mic up front. What a great question. Have the recent hack, you mean stuff like Dirty Cow and? Well, so my question was, for the record, uh, have the recent hacks changed our compliance controls at all? So we hear these very big things like Target and the federal government and uh, all these credit card numbers being hacked, LinkedIn. So is it helping? Are our compliance controls working? If people get in, is the data encrypted? Or are things still being exposed? Well, so PCI just did an update but it was before some of the most recent hacks. Um, and I, obviously, I don't work in the regulatory body that runs this. I, from my perspective, I've actually found our compliance controls have really helped, um, not with the specific problem that you're talking about, which is like ripping off databases of IDs, but with the stuff that I mentioned, selfishly, right? Um, uh, there was a recent um, Linux, the, the, this Linux dirty cow um, exploit that was just horrible. And probably any, anybody here that runs a shop spent the next month patching systems probably, right? Um, that's where I found the benefit, that there is a mechanism um, because we have compliance for us to uh, understand what that is and we have, a, we have a pattern of being able to do those kinds of updates because we have to for compliance reasons. So it becomes, um, it becomes a very routine kind of thing, even though we're doing it on demand because we heard of an exploit. Um, I, our focus on security, to try to go back to your original question, um, is just to be as super diligent all the time. Not even, so I'm talking about standards and how to get past the auditors and all this kind of stuff. But the reality is that you want to build effective controls because you want effective controls in your environment. When you have those controls in place and you see what the leakage is, you realize, what value there was in actually putting them in place in the first place. So, I, not a great, there you go. Anything else? Behind you there's a gentleman. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, I have a quick question. Do you use any third party tools for the compliance check or is it all built in house? Ah, uh, okay. Especially so we, around infrastructure. We, well, so the, the, the tool that we use 
we're an, this is an enterprise conference, so we're an enterprise, and we have lots of security people who help us with our help us with our compliance, and they really do help. Actually, it's not just I'm not throwing shade at, at our compliance folks. Um, they make our jobs really a lot easier. Um, so I'm sorry. Can you just restate your question one more time so I can make sure I get it right? You know, I was wondering whether you use any third-party tools, tools for the tools. compliance or build it on. We have one tool that we use that's really risk management, and uh, so what happens with so I run a bunch of controls. And at, periodically, I'm asked to assess the effectiveness of those controls. We use a third-party tool to do that. So all the controls are loaded into the third-party tool. And the way this looks is it'll say, like, okay, change management, were there any breakdowns? What's a breakdown? Well, if I had an outage because of a change, that's a breakdown. If I have a change that was made without approval, that's a breakdown. Those things happen occasionally, right? So, so then you have to actually do the postmortem, put some kind of fix in, and if it happens more than once, so the classic example for me was I had a contractor who fat fingered a change and caused an outage. And people make mistakes for a bunch of reasons. Um, sometimes it's the environment then, that they're in. But it happened again, right? So the first time the remediation was to adjust the process. Second time the remediation was to do broader education. The third time the remediation was to remove the employee from the account, the contractor. Because you have to do something, you have to escalate if the thing is broken. You really have to fix it. So that, that's the one tool, and it just, basically, it just basically allows me to certify for each control or process that I own that it's effective and call out any discrepancies, which auditors will then ask me about. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm easy to find. If you have any other questions, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.